The Magic of Trees Welcome home. This is planet Earth, a speck of rock, water and carbon life forms within the universe. It's also where we live. 71% of planet Earth is water, and about a third of the rest of it, the land base, is forested, and that's where the trees come in. Have you ever really thought about trees in any detail? Well, they're just plants. Lettuce, roses, daisies, grass, petunias. They're plants too. But trees are just so different. Let's go on a little journey and see what we can learn. Trees are things of beauty in so many different ways. They frame and define entire landscapes, and they give us that sense of place we cherish so much. Here we see black cottonwoods in Idaho along a floodplain. And here, ponderosa pines on the slope of the Fraser Canyon in British Columbia, clinging to steep, relatively barren soil landscapes. Trees also soften urban landscapes. Street trees, city trees, park trees, they're really important. They filter pollutants, they shade us, they give us numerous health benefits, and these trees, seen here in the Champs-Élysées in Paris, are a good example of what street trees can do for us, if we look after them. Trees come in many shapes and sizes, but basically two main types, the conifers and the deciduous or broadleaf trees. And of course, just to make it more interesting, we also have some deciduous conifers. Here we have a conifer, Sitka spruce, and each little needle on that tree is doing its thing, acting like a solar panel. And here we have broadleaf trees, maple in this example, larger, flatter leaves, but again, each one functions as a solar panel, collecting the sun's energy and through the magic of photosynthesis, producing carbohydrates that the tree can use to survive and grow later on. And the deciduous trees and give us the most amazing fall colours in some parts of the world. Here we are in Quebec. Il Madore. Beautiful colours. Oranges, yellows, reds, all intermingled with the greens of the conifers. And we can stand there and watch the colour get really vibrant for a while. And then in a few days or weeks it slowly fades into the winter season until next year. It's magic just to sit and see so many colours in one place at one time. And then there are the oddities such as the Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia, a monocotyledon with strange shapes and its crown of leaves high at the top of the trees. Get close to a tree. Look at the fine details. There's so much to look at in a tree. Look at the symmetry of this palm tree. It's such a well-ordered way of growing. And look at those attachment points in a different palm tree. Left, right, left, right, left, right incredibly well awed pattern of development. Of course, not all trees have that well ordered pattern. This tree, the Nine Dragon Juniper at the Summer Palace in Beijing, is several hundred years old. Look at the disorder here. Look at that gnarly stem, the rugged bark and the contorted growth pattern. This tree has a lot of history, many stories to tell. And look at Arbutus in the Pacific Northwest with its incredibly thin layers of bark. If the bark is there to protect a tree, Arbutus almost seems to be vulnerable with its bark being so thin. This is an ancient weathered old pine in Arizona, a beautiful mix of weathered greys, browns and oranges. So much history to see when we stop and look closely. And it's not just single trees that have some magic. Trees and forests have been around a long time. This is an ancient and increasingly rare primeval forest up on the coast of British Columbia. This forest has been untouched by human interventions other than climate change. It's a landscape that has simply evolved since the last ice age left around 11,000 years ago. Generations of trees have evolved, died, new trees have come up, and we're left with this amazing landscape of really old trees magic just to see it and walk through it and feel history growing all around you. Stand and stare at it. Realize that, wow, this forest has never ever been logged and here it is in all its majesty. There are very few places left on this planet like that. 
and trees grow in the most ridiculous places. Here we see trees clinging to the margins of life, high on the cliff tops above the Pacific Ocean along the outer coast of Vancouver Island. This Sitka spruce fell over at some point in the past. It fell down and then decided not to give up. It grew back into vertical, and here it is decades later. Its roots cling to the top of the bank, and the tree carries on, still doing its thing. Another ridiculous sight. On rocks where there seems to be no soil or moisture, yet these shore pines on the summit slopes of the Squamish Chief in British Columbia are growing where there's almost no soil. Just a crack in the rock filled with needle litter. And yet they've managed to grow quite large, and very slowly, no doubt. Incredible resilience to grow so well in such difficult conditions. And then there's the really old trees. This is a Lursae, Fitzroya cuprosoides, the only species in the genus, seen here high in the Chilean Andes. These trees get to be about three and a half thousand years old and become the size of an old growth Douglas fir, but with annual rings so small they're barely visible to the naked eye. This is one of the best lunches I ever had, sitting by this tree and trying to sort out who was around on the planet when this tree germinated. I don't think I actually figured it out. And perhaps my favourite tree, the bristle cone pine, seen here in the Sierra Nevada of California. Some of these trees are over four and a half thousand years old. That means they germinated at around the start of the Bronze Age, which is also around the time formal writing systems started to be developed. If you really want to experience a magical tree moment, go and meet a bristlecone pine. Sit down next to it, snuggle up, put your arm around it and imagine four and a half thousand years of growth and it's still growing. Can you imagine if we could sit and talk with such trees and learn all about the incredible history and the phases of history it's gone through? These are Chinese red pines only a thousand years old, on the side of Mount Hua in the Shanxi province of China, again growing in what seems like incredibly difficult conditions on the side of granite cliffs. Also on Mount Hua, I came across an 800-year-old paperbark maple, Asa grisium. Oddly enough, we often plant these under power lines as they're thought to be the right tree for the right place. Clearly, if we gave these trees long enough, that might not be true. It would be the wrong tree for the wrong place, and if we gave it the opportunity, the tree would easily outgrow the height of the power lines. And over in London, England, we have ancient English oak trees. This one estimated to be around 900 years old, and it germinated when the Plantagenets were taking over after the Norman Conquest in England. It's completely hollow. You can walk right through it, but the crown's still quite healthy. These trees have gone through an immense amount of stress. They've been silent witnesses to many battles. Kings and queens have come and gone, and all the while these oak trees have just carried on. Over in Sweden, a basswood in the Skyter Garden in Uppsala, a youngster at around 400 years old, but still in amazingly good condition. It's really incredible. All that history locked up in one tree. And what about those massive trees that have grown over the many ruined temples in Cambodia? This one, at Ta Prom, is estimated to be about 500 years old. And like so many of these big old trees, its roots are slowly forcing the stones apart and damaging what's left of the temple structure. Not all trees are massive. This is a bonsai Siberian elm in Kowloon, about 200 years old, but less than two feet high. That's a lot of human intervention and a lot of tender loving care to keep the tree alive, so healthy and so small. Many generations of people have looked after these bonsai trees. And then there's the elfin forests. This is at Morro Bay near San Luis Obispo in California. These coast live oak trees are not much taller than 20 feet, but 200 to 400 years old. A fun place to visit. You might think such small trees are really quite young, but they're not. Walk through it. Experience the magic of dwarf old trees. And let's not forget that every year each tree adds on more wood. In the temperate forests, the growth ring is usually annual, but in the tropics, it's often seasonal, with several growth spurts in any one 12-month period. Look closely at the wood. 
Each growth ring is a diary with entries for every year and every season, recording what happened in the environment as the wood was laid down. Once we start to learn and read the growth patterns, we can look into nature's history. This is an oak tree, characteristic growth rings, each one showing one year of growth. We can see each year starting off with the spring and the early wood, leading into the summer and the later wood, and then comes dormancy, and another year of growth is added in the following year. Some of those really old trees, like the Brussels cones and the Alerse, grow very, very slowly. Their growth rings are incredibly tiny, some only a few cells wide, and scarcely discernible with the naked eye. The Alerse on the right here has growth rings less than half a millimeter wide, but each growth ring is a record of drought, flood, fire, good years, bad years, and they're all captured in what we really can see as a wooden diary. That's why scientists get such useful information about past weather patterns by analyzing tree rings. So when we look at wood, we can imagine everything that has gone by. What we are looking at is layers of history. This is pinion pine lying on the ground, layer after layer of history laid down in the dusts of time. This is Arbutus, and we can read the patterns of growth and learn that this tree did not grow vertically. It leaned from the bottom towards the top. Was it pushed over in a storm? Was it reaching for sunlight? Douglas fir, driftwood washed up on the beach, and again we can see layer after layer of wooden fiber history. Not all old trees have an interesting time surviving. Look at the interesting grain patterns here, all sorts of twists and turns and contortions in this wood, right at the base of the tree trunk. That wood grain reflects all sorts of environmental stresses and it records the harsh realities of where this tree grew. And look at deadwood on the ground. Look at those grain patterns and the way the tree grew around old branches. Or look at this juniper in the Grand Canyon, a lateral limb, a wound, wood growing around the wound, and the tree eking out an existence in the very hostile conditions, but managing to survive for decades, perhaps hundreds of years, despite it all. And of course, when our favorite tree dies, we celebrate the loss. Even when they're dead, we like to remember them. Here on Aspen in Colorado, and it may last for perhaps another 10 or 20 years before it falls down and decays back into the soil. And then there's the famed hollow tree in Stanley Park in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's really just a stump at this point, but it's estimated to have been over a thousand years old when it died in the mid 1800s. And it's a cultural icon in Vancouver. When we look through the archives, we find there pictures of elephants, old cars, horses, and lots of family group shops. It really is a part of our cultural psyche. I spent 18 months helping to save and restore the hollow tree and the wood inside or some of it had 20 rings per inch, and it was incredibly hard wood, really difficult to drill through when we were installing the steel bolts holding the stump together. Sometimes trees are spared the log's axe. This is Lonely Doug, an old growth tree in a clear cut near Port Renfrew on Vancouver Island. It's a huge tree. If you look carefully at the base of the tree on the right side, you'll see a small white dot. That's a person sitting at the base of the tree. Who knows why the tree was spared? Perhaps it struck a chord with a logger who thought at least one should be saved. And thank goodness he did. Old growth trees and old growth forests are an important part of the planet and they're rapidly disappearing. We really ought to do more to appreciate them than we do. And did I mention tree bark? It comes in so many shapes and colors. It's a photographer's dream spend hours getting lost in the magical imagery available in tree bark. This is Albizia in China. Beautiful flaking bark, stunning colors with all sorts of funky little bits and pieces to it. And there's so many different textures and types of bark. This is a coral tree in Hong Kong where the bark and the tree trunks covered in thorns. And those thorns are really quite vicious. I've no idea what their ecological function is, but there must have been one. So when you next go out and have the chance to look at trees, reflect on the fact they're giant plants. Some are tall and straight. Some will be curved or be malformed from a human point of view. But they're not just stands of sticks. 
the trees and all the magic that they bring. Like this basswood on Rhode Island with its strange lateral limb that's been growing that way for most of the tree's life. Not what we think of when we think of a basswood, but there it is, a healthy tree, really funky, completely different from what we might expect to see. Pause, stand and stare, look at the foliage, the cones, the bark. Reflect on the whole tree and its life, past, present and future. Where do you fit in the growth rings? Look up. Look at that huge crown of this old oak tree. Massive branches, each one made up of millions of individual wood cells, each one contributing in some way, supporting the wood, transporting nutrients and water up the tree, or moving carbohydrates down the tree. And ponder this huge spreading oak tree in Texas. Millions and millions of wood cells, a massive spreading tree crown history locked up in wood. And think about the magic of nature where trees are so well adapted to their environment, like these spruce trees silhouetted at sunrise in northern Alberta. Here we see that columnar form so typical of the spruces designed to shed snow and survive harsh winter conditions. And of course trees die, they all do, even the bristle cones will eventually die. But that's not the end of the story. Even then, that dead wood is habitat for insects and small animals. And woodpeckers come and dig holes and feed on the insects and make nests. And trees lying on the ground are habitat for salamanders and other creatures before the wood eventually decays and comes back into the ground and becomes soil. And new trees come up and the whole cycle starts again. And the magic of the tree and the forest is perpetuated in some new form. Trees. They have defined us in so many ways. We have waged war over them, and some of our earliest writings, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, record the battles over the massive cedars in ancient Sumeria and the guardian of the forest, Hombaba. Small wonder, then, that trees have inspired so many people and poets. For many of us, trees provide a magical, mystical connection to planet Earth, perhaps a spiritual tie to nature that we cannot define, but we feel in our heart. Maybe that's why planting trees bring so much hope and fulfillment. Whatever the reason, trees deserve our respect. Look at them closely, touch them, feel them, be grateful for the many benefits they give us. They're magical in so many ways. A man of 80 planting, to build at such an age might be no harm argued three youngsters from a neighbouring farm. But to plant trees? The old boy was plainly wanting. For what in heaven's name, said one of them, can possibly reward your pains unless you live to be Methuselah? Why tax what little of your life remains to serve a future you will never see? Is it so, said he? My children's children, when my trees are grown, will bless me for their kindly shade. What then? Has any law forbade the wise to toil for pleasure not his own? To picture theirs is my reward today. Perhaps tomorrow also. Who shall say?